Dr. Barbara Ann Murphy is the uh, inventor and the president of Equilume Light Mask. And uh, she's going to be here talking today about uh, her product, what they do, the whole concept behind lights, and uh, some very, very interesting, unique technology. And we're greatly, greatly appreciative for her uh, traveling all this way to spend this time with us. So without further ado, I hand you over to uh, Dr. Barbara Murphy. Thank you very much, Jeff. I've managed to be overdressed and underdressed simultaneously for this event, so apologize. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about how we can set the mood with the right lighting in our dating game. And I am delighted to be here. It's actually my first time in Saratoga. I was lucky enough to do my PhD in Kentucky at the Gluck Center. And every year, I'd work the Keeneland sales. But I always wanted to get up to the Saratoga sales, but never managed. So maybe I have to come back sales time again. What I'd like to go through with you today is first briefly tell you a little bit about light, because light all light is not the same, okay? And there's properties of sunlight that are very, very important for us as humans and for horses. And we need to start thinking about using light that better mimics sunlight when we, um, in our stabled horses. Then I'm gonna go on to talk to what's most of interest to you right now is getting those dry mares cycling in lighting for our barren and maiden mares. I also want to talk to you about lighting for pregnant mares. It is a topic that not many people are as well informed about, but it's an area where we can really influence the breeding efficiency on our farms by knowing how to use lighting correctly for our pregnant mares before they foal. And then I'd like to touch on some very new and exciting research that you'll be the first people in North America to hear about is that we've developed some new lighting for horses in training that can really help them with their response to training in their growth and their development and their um, muscle performance. So every single cell in your body has a clock, a 24-hour clock that is kept in time by signals from the environment. And there's a master clock controlling all the peripheral clocks throughout our body in the brain. And this brain clock coordinates both our daily rhythms in physiology and our annual rhythms in, in physiology. And in particular with the horse, the most important annual rhythm we're interested in is the annual rhythm of reproduction. But these biological clocks that control so much of our physiology in every tissue need to be reset to the correct time every day. They're looking for environmental signals from dawn and dusk to stay in tune with the environment. And how do they do that? Well, only in the last 10 to 15 years, they have found a new set of cells at the back of the retina that aren't responsible for vision. They're not about communicating information to create our vision and our ability to see. Their sole role is to synchronize our biological clocks to the right time of day and the right time of year. And these cells have a new type of pigment in them that is really interested in blue light. Short wavelength blue light is what stimulates these cells a message is sent to our master clock in the brain, and then all these messages are sent throughout our body saying, it's time to get up, it's morning time, or it's time to slow down, it's evening time. And if you look at the diagram of the horse up here, what I want to kind of get through to you is the lung, the kidney, the muscle, the heart, the bone, each one of the tissues has a clock. And when our circadian clock, which is our 24 hour or our daily clock gets disrupted, we feel out of sorts. This happens when we get jet lagged. This happens when we do shift work. This happens when we expose ourselves to white light at nighttime, which disrupts our clock because on a planet where the main signal is the light dark cycle and has been like that for millennia, Organisms don't know how to deal with the invention of the light bulb and traveling around the world. 
So blue light is very important for our health and our physiological um, functioning. What I mean by all light is not equal, on the top, I don't know how I press the pointer, there might not be one, on the top left hand diagram here is the spectrum that's created by natural daylight, by sunlight. So the white light that we see coming out of the bulbs is a combination of blue, red and green light. When you mix them together, white light is formed. So if you take a spectral a picture of what sunlight looks like, you can see that there's an awful lot of blue light, some green and some red, but it peaks in the blue light. And that's what keeps our bodies, when we used to live outdoors and not in uh, houses and in offices every day, keeps our body in tune with the environment. So horses living outside are getting great exposure to good lighting. Now, if we look at the incandescent light bulb on the right-hand corner, so this is typical of the lighting you might have in your home, and you see that there's very little blue, and it's mostly the orangey, red, yellowy light, which we are familiar with. It's not great for keeping us alert. It doesn't keep us awake or good for concentration. It's good in the evening time. On the left-hand corner, I will talk to you about this is the light we've developed that we're going to be seeing a lot more of for horses, but I want to just focus you on the fluorescent spectrum. So most stables, the most common form of lighting, particularly in training barns and in American-style um, breeding barns, are fluorescent tubes. And fluorescent light has almost no blue component. They're great, they do show some light, but they're orangey yellowy, so they're not really great for animals to be exposed to a long time. What communicates the lighting signal to our bodies is a very important hormone called melatonin. Melatonin is known as the hormone of darkness. It's produced during darkness hours, so at night, and it is turned off by light particularly blue light. So it's when those little new cells at the back of the eye receive blue light signals, then melatonin is turned off. And by doing this, it allows an animal to know whether it's nighttime or daytime, and by the duration of melatonin, like in the long winter nights, it tells them what time of year it is. This message allows, allows horses and humans to regulate our rest and our activity. When melatonin rises at night, that's when we get sleepy. Our immune system, so that when you have disruption of these rhythms, our ability to cure ourselves and heal from disease is suppressed. Reproduction, the seasonal rhythm of reproduction in horses is completely regulated by this hormone and by its response to light. Other things it's very important in regulating is mood, well-being, and weight gain. So a lot of metabolic disorders and metabolic syndrome can be caused by disruption of these rhythms. This is what a 48-hour period of melatonin secretion looks like in a group of mares. Kept in the springtime, the bars at the bottom show the hours of light and the hours of dark. And you can see that when the sun is up and when the lights are on, melatonin is very low. It rises at nighttime and it gives this lovely rhythm. And that tells the animal what time of year it is. So just to give you an idea, horses outside, or us when we're exposed to good daylight hours of, of sunlight, have rhythms in our body that are very strong. They're good rhythms. They allow our body to work well in synchrony with the environment, to rest at night, be active at day, and for our immune system to work well. But where there is poor lighting, like in the depths of winter in Ireland, we get up in the dark, we go into an office with a fluorescent tube, we go home in the dark, and what happens then is our rhythms flatline. They don't really, they're not very strong. And a lot of people can suffer from seasonal affective disorder in the winter. It's all due to a lack of light and a lack of a strong melatonin rhythm. And this can also be the, the case with horses who spend a long time, 23 hours a day for a lot of horses in training, in poorly lit stables. So that's just an introduction to the different types of light there is and how they can have an impact on our bodies. 
So let's talk about our barren mares. So we know horses are seasonal breeders. Nature intended that as the days get longer, there's some grass growth there. There's a lot more visibility to see predators. Think about the animal out in the wild in a feral situation. The climate is getting warmer. It's the optimum time to raise bloodstock or to raise offspring. They're more likely to survive if they're born in the spring in the wild. So the natural breeding season occurs between May and October, and you will actually still find quite a lot of mares cycling right up until the end of November. When they don't cycle, usually, is January, February, March, when we would like them to be cycling. Light drives this rhythm, and as the daylight gets longer, melatonin is reduced, and this activates the reproductive system in the mare. So increasing day length stimulates reproduction through the hormone melatonin, because when there is a long winter night and a long duration of melatonin, it shuts off the key hormone in the reproductive cascade in the mare, and that is gonadotropin releasing hormone, or GNRH. So when we talk about bosarolin or deslaurolin, ovulation inducing agents in the mare, we're talking about a synthetic form of this key hormone called GNRH. So as we go naturally from March to June, the days are getting longer, melatonin drops, GNRH rises, and the mare comes into season. However, we have interfered with nature's approach for a few reasons. I blame an Englishman for the January 1st date. Sometime in the 1800s, they decided let's make it more fair for the same age horses to race at the same time of, at the same age group. So the 1st of January birth date requires that in order to be economically competitive, we would like foals to be born early. They go on to become hopefully the sales topping yearlings and are precocious enough to race as two-year-olds. And as we all know, there's a big difference in the price of a colt born in January versus born in June. And there's even some statistics on this now that there's a significant increase in price if you have particularly colts born before mid-March. So beware the Ides of March. So how do we overcome this? Well, we've been doing it for decades. We can very successfully keep our mares in the stable, 100 watt light bulb, 12 foot by 12 foot box, enough light to read a newspaper. That was published back in the 1950s and very little was done to learn more about that lighting since then until the recent years. You need about 75 days of artificial lighting and I say this because it takes 70 days on average for the first ovulation of the season in response to light therapy. You put your mares under lights, the average mare will ovulate 70 days later. That's from multiple studies conducted around the world. Now there's a lot of variability. You'll have mares ovulate after 50 days, you'll have mares that won't ovulate until 90 days, but 70 days on average. That's why we recommend that you start last week, <laughs> before Thanksgiving, if you really want to get her cycling for the start of the opening of the breeding sheds. And another reason is, and um, Scott and, and Dr. O'Kane might have other ideas or might have suggestions on this, but in general, from what I've read, the first ovulation of the season is not necessarily the most fertile. And the second ovulation can sometimes be the endometrium has had more time, the uterine lining, everything is better for, for maintenance of a pregnancy. So if you can cover your mare on that second ovulation where you have a stronger cycle, you might have better luck. So beginning on November 15th or December 1st or this week, Data clearly shows that if you every week you wait after today, you're going to have on average a later uh, first ovulation on the other side. So you can't really start much earlier, but once if you if you delay it, you're looking at later ovulations. On average, mares will spend 100 days under lights. That's if you start now, if you breed them on the 15th of February and you scan them in full two weeks later, hopefully in full. Minimum is about 100 days. Now, everywhere I go, there's different arguments about how much this actually costs. 
It can be anywhere from $10 a day if you're doing the mucking out yourself to $50, $60 a day if you're boarding at Coolmore or whatever it, it, it is. I take an average around the world of $20 to $25 and I could be way below par for the New York area, so apologies if I am. But even at that price, you're looking at about $2,500 on just maintenance fees for your mare. Now you are going to have to bring them in to tease them, getting closer to time, but there's two months there where she could be out. And whatever about what it costs, all the feedback we've received since I've started this whole project on the mobile lighting is that the mares are more fertile when they're outside, they're less stressed, they have less fluid, and they just seem to um, conceive more conceive better on first service. They get more first service su success rates. Because we'd learn about how important oxytocin is for uterine contractions, exercise does a really great job of that too, moving around. The alternative is 16 hours a day standing in a stall if you leave them out in the morning and bring them back in at four. So I'm going to quickly go through this, but I want to know how much light do they really need? And do they really need it to both eyes? Because I've worked with barren mares that have only one eye and they respond to light. So light to one eye should override darkness to the other. And as well as that, when I first started doing the melatonin research that you saw there, the late Dr. Barry Fitzgerald in Kentucky used to tell us when we were going in to pull a blood sample at night from a horse, whatever you do, don't shine the flashlight in the mare's eye, because you'll immediately impact melatonin. And when you think about it, if you're pulling a blood sample from a catheter on the left side of the neck, if you have a flashlight, it's only going to affect one eye because you can't get around the other side. But he knew that that would immediately affect melatonin. So that really led me to think, well, maybe we can design something. And of course, nobody's going to buy a mask with light shining on both eyes. People ask me all the time, so why is it only on one eye? I was like, you put your prize mare with light shining in both eyes and let her out in the paddock at night, see what happens. Um, but they can behave normally with light to one eye. Long story short, engineering students got very excited with the idea of working with horses. They then got very frustrated with working with horses because there were wires and batteries and completely mangled electronics just from a horse in a stable because they, the strength and the size of them and when they don't want something on their head, they will get it off. So we had lots of fun and games. But what we found out was that if you use low intensity blue light, so white light has all the colors of the spectrum. We now know blue light is what controls melatonin. So if you just use blue light, you can use a lot less of it. It's not for them to be able to see with, it's just to stimulate these receptors. What we found is, as I fall off the stage, we find that, oops, one second. There should be a circle on the 50 lux. So in a, in a well-lit stable, it should be 250 lux is the light intensity. And you can buy a little light meter at the store and actually test it. In the dark, you see the melatonin level rises. We looked at very low intensities blue light, 3, 10, 50, and 100, which is about, about seven or eight times lower than the light in here from these lights. If we give it to one eye, we found that once we got to 50 lux, there was no difference with the suppression of melatonin in the, in the well-lit stable or with this amount of light. So this was the genesis for, gee, maybe we can actually use this as a tool to get mares to cycle without leaving them in the barn. Of course, then you've got to show it works in the field, literally. So what we did is I got onto my buddies in Kentucky and there happened to be a farm that had 26 barren mares that were all going to the February sales. So if they weren't cycling, they didn't care. So they let us try the light mask on them. And we had a very rough prototype. In the first group here on the left are their mares that were in under lights, well-fed, warm, looked after. The second group had 
a leather headpiece on with a single little light that came on at 4.30 and turned off at 11 every day. And the third group, outdoor, no light, are mares that were on the research farm across the road that had no exposure to light. So Haggard's did helped me with a lot of the palpations, Dr. Luke Fallon, um, and we did a lot of progesterone assays to see exactly when they had their first ovulation. So the dark blue means the mares were cycling. They had ovulated. They were actually actively cycling. You can see there's about 85% in the indoor group were cycling, 80% in the outdoor group. These were unrugged mares. Oops, unrugged mares fed maintenance feed with a light mask on them. And compared to the outdoor group, 20% of these mares were cycling. The light blue is transitional, and the, and the lighter blue is still in winter and estrus. So you can see that mares, 20% of mares are going to cycle all year round regardless. The problem is we never know which 20% are going to do it that particular year. It has a lot to do with whether they lactated and had a foal the previous year, their age, etc. But this was a no, no significant difference in the amount of mares that were cycling. They had responded to the little blue light. This was the prototype at that time. It was one little light. It was very rough. It fell off nearly every night. And my student ran around the fields at 5 o'clock in the freezing cold, putting these things back together. They were, the wiring went, you name it, it happened. I really wasn't expecting to see the result to be so good. Since then, we have significantly improved the prototype. It now fits a lot better, looks a lot better, works a lot better. There's a whole array of six LEDs of diffuse low blue light that shines on the eye. You activate it once at the start of the season at four o'clock, and then every day it comes on as the light drops. So it has a light sensor in it. It comes on at about five, depending on where it's getting dark, and turns off at 11 o'clock. So you need to give your horse between 14 and 16 hours of light per day, okay? Um, anywhere 14 and a half to 16 is, is just perfect. So you either give them a little bit more light in the morning and then stop it at 8 or 9 o'clock at night, or it's much easier with one product to just leave them alone in the morning and, and lengthen the day from dusk. And we've had some great success. It's a traditional industry, as you well know. We do things the same way for a lot of generations. So it takes time for something new to take off. But it's great when you do have some leaders in the field that embrace it, see it works, and let us spread the word about it. The Australians love it because they love leaving horses outside and handling them as little as possible. So it's, that's been our biggest market to date. But we're starting to, to get traction and we're a small company. It's hard to get around. And uh, I have a day job called lecturing too. So that makes it a bit tough. But that's for your barren mare. This is where I would like to just change a little bit to talk about pregnant mares because I think we're missing the boat on something here as breeders in that we all understand how important it is to get our, our dry mares cycling, to get them cycling, get them bred early, expecting early foals. But what we don't realize is you've given these mares uh, a very short winter. You've put them under lights on the 1st of December. Now they're in foal. And now you expose them to this long, dark winter, when normally in the wild, to foal, the mare would start to see lengthened days again, and the foals would know, hey, it's time to come out. This is the right time of year to be born. And what happens when we don't return that lighting is that mares have longer gestations, foals are born smaller, and mares have fertility problems post foaling. And I'll explain that to you. And I always wondered, well, why? Some vets are aware of the benefits and some breeders of putting their pregnant mares back under lights on December 1st, but it's too expensive to put all your horses under lights. And a lot of people don't realize the benefits associated with it. The gestation length, the normal pregnancy length in the mare is 335 days. These are the mares that are being bred in the summer as nature intended and foal in the late spring, early summer. The thoroughbred industry, it's 345 days. 
Everywhere you look, all the Weatherbees reports, jockey club statistics will give 345 as the average gestation length for the mare bred prior to June. But the biggest problem is that 20% of our breeding stock go longer than 355 days. Now, if you want to keep a mare breeding every year, ideally you should have a mare having her foal at the same time every year, so that you have a one month window to get her back in foal and you have an efficient breeding season without the constant drift in the foaling date for your mares. Because what that results in is you're reducing the full output in your mare. You probably have to skip a year every three years. It's financial loss to you. You're maintaining a mare that's dry for the year. And mares that go over, the foal has often been in there too long. The reason they go over is gestation ending is controlled by the foal running out of room. They run out of space oxygen, food, they get stressed, they have a cortisol response, start, kick starts the whole cascade that gives rise to foaling. So it's not the mare, it's the foal not running out of room. And I'll explain why that happens. But if the foal is in there too long, sometimes like, they've been cooking for 360 days and they still come out small and hairy. What is going on? They've been in the, that environment too long without possibly the right growth hormones. What controls gestation length? Well, a lot of you might be surprised to realize it's light. It's the light the mare receives before she folds. And we can see this clearly and we've tested it, but I just wanted to show you that light is very important. The age of the mare, as mares get older, they have a bigger uterus, they have less elasticity, they have more room to fill. So it takes longer for the fold to grow to fill it. Um, the fetal factors, colts generally go two days longer. Um, that was reported once upon a time. I don't know how accurate it is anymore. If you look at a large stud farm, this is a large breeding farm operation in Kentucky. I just wanted all their breeding records. They had about 140 mares this particular year. And I looked at the month they conceived versus their gestation length. And you can see it agrees, 345 is normal. 345 days is their average gestation length before mid-May. The mares that fold in June and later even in July had a 335. That's normal for the horse, and that's the right time of year for the horse. So there's a longer gestation length prior to that. And I believe that it's the mares are, that are, are foaling on time are actually receiving the light signal for the correct time of year. Now, people will say it's nutrition. We've, there's a lot of studies done that shows you can starve a mare and not affect her gestation length. Okay, they didn't completely starve her, but they really low low food intake versus high food intake, the main factor is actually light. Same group of mares, and I got some interesting other information, foals born early in the year tend to be born lighter. There is a 10 pound on average difference between foals that are born in January to early February versus April to June. As you get closer to the natural breeding season, the mares are being exposed to the longer days of light, hormone changes are starting to happen in the mare that influence the foal's development, you get a heavier foal. And now this does not mean you don't get large, big foals early in the year, but on average, in the 120 mares that we studied in this study, the heavier foals were born at the end. And it coincided with the shortest gestation length. So it's counterintuitive to a lot of people that you can have a normal gestation length and an optimum sized foal. What's happening earlier in the season is potentially some dismaturity where foals are not getting the growth signals they need to develop. So foals that are born outside of the natural season are not getting sufficient day length. The mare is not getting the sufficient day length to stimulate important growth hormones. And there's one in particular that's very important and it's called insulin-like growth hormone one, insulin-like growth factor one, and it's responsible for bone mineralization, for putting down the bone scaffold in the foal in utero. So you can, that last three months in utero are critical. It's the fastest time in the horse's entire life at which it grows. 
the last three months. You cannot make, up, make it up afterwards. And during that time, the mayor's system is starting to respond to the changing time of year, spring. Light turns on a hormone which is seasonally regulated called IGF-1, also prolactin, a bunch of other growth hormones that circulate in the mare's blood, communicate to the foal, it's the time of year to be born. This is, we're getting close to the optimum time of year for you to be in the environment. The foal develops and develops rapidly in that last three months. We often, oops, if you're going to see dismaturity in foals or this image of a radiograph on the right showing incomplete um, ossification of knee bones, I think, vets, is that, is that the knee or the hock? <laughs> I can't tell. But anyway, you can see a soft, the cuboidal bones are non-ossified. That's bone mineralization. That's laying down the framework of your foal's potential skeleton. Or skeleton. And if that happens, oftentimes the foals are born a little bit dismature. When this happens is early in the year. You don't see this happen in May, June mares that foal because they have received the right light. Can light therapy influence gestation length? I wanted to find that out, um, and we had the light masks up and running at this point, so we got a farm involved in Ireland that had a lot of older mares that have a history of long gestation lengths, and we selected a group of mares that in their previous two gestations had gone 350 days or longer. And basically, on December 1st, we fitted them with light masks. They were due to foal February, March, April, OK? So what we saw was an 11-day reduction in gestation length just by giving these mares light for, from the 1st of December. This was part of a student's master's thesis at UCD. But 11 days is a nice, nice section of time when you're trying to get a mare back in foal. So the answer was, yes, we can. And since then, we have quite a few of our clients that use it, particularly in Ireland and England, where I've had more chance to speak to them, <laughs> um, use it on their older mares or mares that they know have a history of going over time. And this particular stud showed the five-year average, a significant reduction of about nine to 10 days. But in the year that they used it, the, the um, x-axis there shows the number of days the mares went past 340, because 340 is kind of the number that, that you guys use. So you see some mares going 20 and 30 days past their due date. The, the year they put lights on their mares, um, from the 1st of December, they brought them back to a normal gestation length. It was a two-week reduction. Can we influence the foal birth weight? And I used to say foal size here, then I realized it's not really the size, it's not the height, it's the weight of the, of the foal because the bone is so important in our, in our performance horses. So I did this study in collaboration with my old colleagues at the Gluck Center in Kentucky, who just happened to have 30 pregnant mares that they'd all ins inseminated with the same semen. It's very hard to do a study like this on a commercial farm because the genetics of the sire are going to influence, as we've heard, the conformation and the size of the foals born. So we used from all of the same stallion, they were all due to fall within a one week or one month window, so time of year was pretty consistent. We divided them in two and we put light masks on half of them on the 1st of December. Weighed the foals at birth, that's all, it was very simple. And even with a group this, sm this small, I think we were 29 mares total, there was a significant effect on full birth weight. The foals were born eight and a half pounds heavier in the group that had the light. Now, this kind of marries with what we see in the industry from January until June in the average full birth weight. So there's no reason. What we're doing is we're not making them heavier, we're preventing them being born lighter, which is a lack of light that controls growth hormones in the mare. So the answer is yes. You can use light therapy, whether it's mares in a barn with good lights or mares outdoors with mobile lighting.
things we have not tested in a scientific manner, but we're constantly hearing from our clients, is that we see best, better post-folding fertility in mares who've received light before they foal. You've often heard about particularly maiden and early foaling mares that have their foal heat and then they shut down. They're not shutting down, they haven't activated yet. A mare will foal does not mean her ovaries are active. She still needed to have received the light to turn on GNRH, to turn on FSH and LH for those, follic those ovaries to activate. So a lot of names have been given to this. One is lactational anesterous, maybe because she's lactating, she doesn't have enough energy to be reproductively active. I'd call that BS, to be honest. I think it is the lack of light to the mares. You don't see this in late foaling mares. You see it in early foaling mares. You can prevent it. Now, we don't know what mares are going to do it every year, but those one or two mares that you spent all that money and time getting to conceive early, they foal early, and now you lose two months trying to get her back to cycle. It's not necessary. Give her light beforehand. Whatever way you do it, it's up to you, but it prevents that. We've eliminated it on some farms in the Southern Hemisphere who bought into this concept. Other things we're hearing is that mares, uh, some farms that religiously collect uh, IgG concentrations from the first milk, from that all important colostrum, found that there are higher levels if the mare has been under lights. Light turns on prolactin and a number of other important hormones that prepare the mare for the spring and for, for lactating. So wouldn't it be nice to know that you can ensure your foals have better immunity from day one just by giving the mare light and letting her own hormones do the work. Particularly in maiden mares, one of the key reasons for fostering foals is that a thoroughbred mare is not producing enough milk. They're probably the mares that were bred early, that are foaling early, that haven't had light and don't bag up because they just, you know, they're, they're young and they haven't had the hormones in order to, ha to have good milk production. Again, somewhat preventable by giving the mare light before she foals. Some people were worried that if they wear light masks outside with their foal at foot that they won't see their foal. So that we put the, the cup over the right eye because as was explained earlier, we tend to handle horses on the left just for historically. Anybody know why we handle horses on the left? Where that came from? Why we mount on the left? Anything in the Middle Ages that would have gotten the way of getting on the horse Sword. So the sword is on the left side. So you can throw your right leg over and whip out your sword. <laughs> you can't do that on the right way because the sword gets in the way. That is why we handle horses on the left. Anyway, uh, aside from that, we wanted to show people that mares can see their foals just fine with the, the, the slight blockage on the right. And also, they don't, they're not bothered by it at all. We have had about eight, seven to 8,000 mares with these on. We've had one report of one going through a fence. Now, she could have gone through a fence for many reasons, but you, anyone is going to say, oh, it must have been the light mask. But out of eight, seven to 8,000 mares, I think that's pretty good statistics. Just to make it scientific, as we like to do, we put activity monitors on mares with or without a light mask and monitor their grazing patterns over 24, 48 hour periods and their total activity. The light does not bother them in any way and most people won't believe it until they see it and they see the little blue lights bobbing out in the field and realize they're not bothered by it at all. So in a nutshell, the benefits that we have found from mobile lighting is you get early cyclicity, just the same as uh, lights in a box. You can normalize gestation lengths. There's no reason your mare shouldn't fall at the same time every year. And that 10 extra days helps you with deciding whether or not you fall on foal heat or you breed on foal heat, whether you short cycle. It gives you just a little bit more leeway to get her back in foal. It optimizes full birth weights. It ensures that we are returning what nature would have given to her if we'd let them alone to foal during the summer months. It does lower overheads. And unless you can find somewhere to board your mare for $3 a day, it's going to be a lot more cost effective. But right now, 
And I was asked this earlier, and I did confirm, Joan, they are everywhere in America, they're $400, but the New York Thoroughbred Breeders Association get it at a 10% discount. So for 360 or buy nine, get one free or something. But I'm staying out of sales, that's not my job. Um, so lower overheads, healthier stock. Well, one thing I didn't mention is mares outside, apart from having less fluid, they don't colic. You know, mares in a box colic. You hardly ever see them outside colicking. Pr pregnant mares, you never see dystocias in mares that are outside and that fall out. I know we don't fall out here. They do in the southern hemisphere, but they don't have any issues with uh, dystocias either. In short, it can help you tighten up your breeding season and improve breeding efficiency. Instead of waiting for those one or two mares that are just hanging on and hanging on and not going, um, it can just be a helpful to know. And what we've done with some farms is we've taken their breeding records, we've looked at all their data, we've told them their average gestation length, where they are, shown them the number of days to get mares back in foal. Ideally, you don't want it to be longer than 30, should be your, your cutoff. And they see the improvement year on year when they start to use lights more effectively. So all we're doing, these are the two graphs from that stud farm in Kentucky that shows the full birth weight gradually increase, the average as you get to April and June, and the opposite happens with the gestation length. There is no reason why you can't have an optimum gestation length with an optimum sized foal starting from January all through the season if you use light effectively. So lastly, I'd like to talk about something I'm particularly excited about, which is a new uh, system we're developing for horses in training. Now this will be just as important for show barns, for horses that have to stay indoors, for brood mares that you don't want to fall outside and you want to have them under good lighting but be able to monitor them at night time. Basically, if we look at the top left-hand corner, it's a really nice shot of just the musculature on a thoroughbred running at a flat-out gallop, probably towards the end of a race. They are highly tuned machines, and we need every one of their physiological systems and their organs to work so well in synchrony to give them the chance of giving us the performance that we're looking for. Now, we now know that the synchrony of all these body systems are controlled by the quality of the light-dark cycle. So if we look at natural daylight, this is the spectrum that horses living outside would experience. Most horses in training are in a stable, probably doesn't have a massive amount of natural light getting to it. They're under fluorescent tubes that have zero blue light, okay? So, this, I think, is a problem and one that we can help improve both their mental and physical state by changing the lighting. I aimed to try to mimic the qualities of natural environmental light in the stable. So this means that the white light by day should be blue enriched. It should use some of that blue light that controls our biological clock. We need to eliminate white light at night, and this goes for you guys too. No looking at your phones to check the time in the middle of the night, because your LED screen is blue light, and that immediately causes your melatonin to drop, and it makes you harder to go back to sleep. Plus, it disrupts your rhythms. So no more laptops late at night. And I think the newest iPhones now have an ability that the Sunset app, it'll go red at night. It doesn't go red enough, really but you know, they're, on, they're on the right track. So white light at night, if, you, if anyone walks into a stable later at night and you flick the switch, you'll see the horses blink and they kind of move around. That is immediately sending a, a peak of cortisol through their body, it's a stress response. They would never have been exposed to white light at night, whether it's for security, for feeding, for checking temps, for checking mares, um, it's not a great idea. Red light is the way forward and I'll explain that to you. Another thing about our lighting system, particularly in our training barns where we train very, very early, I was just back from Australia, they train at 3.30 in the morning. The lights go on at 3 in the morning and they finish their day by 8.30. It's amazing. Um, it's a bit messed up, but anyway, 
gradual light changes at dawn and dusk. The sun comes up slowly, light changes. We can actually mimic that quite well by putting dimmer switches on our lights. We've done that. But you also want a lighting system that changes with the seasons. There's a circa annual clock where days get longer in the spring and they get shorter in the winter. That controls a horse's musculature. If you feed horses in the spring, they put on muscle. You feed them in the autumn, they put on fat. It's what they would have done in the wild to get through the winter. And they use food differently at different times of the year. But what if you could bring forward them putting on muscle to earlier in the year, keep that going, have a long summer and shorten the winter? And we are doing that right now with our lighting system. So you want an, a lighting system that reflects changes in day length. You can't keep a mare under lights all year round. She will eventually re, uh, become refractory and ignore the lighting signal. If you want to get mare cycling, they've got to experience at least two months of a winter photo period, dark nights. So what we did was we custom designed a smart lighting system that used LED technology. Great things about LEDs is they are so much cheaper to run. This thing almost makes a third of your electricity bills. Um, we have a gradual dim up and dim down and it goes to red light at night. So we're really getting into the mood now in our dating game. So we have racing stables down in the southern hemisphere that uh, from dusk until three o'clock in the morning, there's a red glow because you can see the horses, they're not bothered by it, you can feed them, do whatever, it stops people turning on a white light. If you, if you leave it darkness, someone will turn on a white light and this one doesn't disrupt them. And this is currently the wavelength of the light that we are using. We peaked it in the blue. So they're getting what looks like the blue sunlight experience, but they get that through the day. And just to check that the red light that we're using doesn't disrupt their body rhythms, we had a bunch of horses under a light dark cycle or a light red cycle. And we looked at their melatonin rhythm. And you can see the rhythm that raises at nighttime under the light dark cycle, it stays the same under the light red cycle. So it maintains their rhythms and doesn't disturb them. But it facilitates anything we need to do with them um, after dark and does not disrupt their rhythms. So we did a trial um, at a very big pre-training yard in Ireland starting in January. So this is the prep work for the Breeze Up sales. These were two-year-olds, just turned two. Starting in mid-January, we had 56 of them. We installed our customized lighting system over half of them. The other group were, on, were in their typical fluorescent tube lighting in their, in their stalls that could come on or off whenever somebody went in to check them during the night and it was kind of erratic and it was quite a low light level. So we monitored their body co composition, their fat percentage, their weight, their coat condition and their fat free mass which is the weight when you take away fat which is muscle and bone over um, 15 weeks. We also wanted to see if the amount of microorganisms in the air, bacteria and fungus which are so critically um, disruptive to the horse's respiratory system um, were reduced under good lighting because we all know that sunlight inhibits microbial growth and make, um, make coat conditions better etc so we wanted to look at that. Give you the results all in one go. Basically on the left hand side is we have the red line is our um, horses under our new lighting system and you can see that by week 12, there's a big gap in the weight between the groups, okay? There's something starting to change. In the body fat, in the middle, you can see that the horses were only starting to jog when we initiated the study on week one. And both groups reduce in body fat as they start doing canter work. They're on the, all on the same training regime, so their body fat kind of stays the same. But this is the critical one here. These, this is their muscle weight gain, plus bone particularly. And by week 9, 12, 15, there seems to be a change in the two groups. 
the horses under the better lighting system that are allowing their circadian rhythms to be a lot more robust. They were resting better at night, they were more alert during the day and we found that they were eating up more. They're putting on more weight and that weight is muscle mass. And we know that there is actually a 32 pound or 14 to 15 kilo difference in the weight between the two groups at the end of the study. So it's pretty interesting. Also, another thing that's very, very interesting was on week two and week eight, we took air and surface samples and we sent it to the Irish Equine Centre who, well, they did the actual samples. They run a whole suite looking for all the bacteria and the fungi mould that they can. And you can see there's a slight drop in the second week in the traditional lighting but by eight weeks there's much less fungus in the air and the surface in the stables that the horses were under this this customized lighting blue light inhibits microbial growth so for a cleaner environment we're inhibiting the bug growth in the stable which can only be a good thing for the respiratory system of the horses and for their health in general so basically, the, this is a one strip of, of stables and this, the, the, the photograph on the left was taken about five minutes before the light started to dim. We had a photographer there, we were making noise, the horses were all alert, heads out, and this is 10 minutes later under the red light. And when I walked down that aisleway, three of them were already lying down. So the actual effect on dropping to red light and the change of the rise in melatonin just switches them off. Um, and it's one of the, the biggest things that the trainers feedback to us was that they found they were more alert during the day and the people, the staff mucking out the stables and anyone who's mucked out the same stables every day knows you can, you know the horse by the stable they leave after them that morning, whether it's completely messy or, or whether they've been box walking or what have you. And they noticed that their stables were a lot less disturbed and easier to clean the next morning, which seems kind of out there, but we could really see it in the fact that they were resting more and they were less anxious at night. So I hope that I've convinced you that lighting is important and not just any light, but good lighting that's enriched in blue. Um, it strongly influences reproductive performance. There's a lot we can do to make our breeding more efficient. And now we're on the verge of seeing it can definitely improve athletic, well, it can improve body composition. We're just about to start our second trial with John Ox in Ireland, a big flat trainer, and we'll be looking at performance parameters and muscle gene expression. But it's an environmental factor that we can control. We're very close to cutting edge with our nutritional science, with our veterinary science, and with our training techniques. This is an area we need to get better at and in the agri-food sector for cows and sheep, but not sheep, they need dark, poultry and pigs, lighting is a huge player in their growth and development and we've somewhat ignored it in horses. So any more information, I left out some information on, on the light mask. Um, our website is improving, it's pretty rubbish at the moment and we're working on a much better one but it takes time and money, we're nearly there. Um, any more information, equiloom.com, you can get me at barbara at equiloom.com. I hope you've seen the light and I am happy to take questions. I was considering a lighter red, and that's the question. It, does it have to be straight red? It can't get to its yes, straight. you want red that has very that has no white in it. So if you look at the, it needs to have a very narrow bandwidth of red. So the redder, the better, mm -hmm. okay, and the darker, the better. If if it's it really only needs to be about five lux, but it's, it's very hard to measure it without a very complicated machine. <laughs> sure. But if the red has too much white in it, the, the melatonin will be suppressed. Yeah. 
So this is something we're going to work on for floodlights, for paddocks, so that we can see our mares at night, for people who want to, to, to breed them in floodlit paddocks, because it's another option instead of buying, you know, light masks. I didn't say that company, yeah. but you could put a, a good floodlit, and for, for foaling mares in particular, they don't like to fall in the light, as we well know. Um, they like to be left alone and in the dark, so red light allows us to see them and allows them to get on with what they need to do. But you don't, light red, if, the darker the red, the better. Can you go back to the charts uh, where the 15 week study, there's three charts. Mm -hmm. It looks like I'm looking at both the weight chart yeah. and the fat-free mass chart is that the two groups started off in different, different, different places. Very good catch. Yes, they did. So the trainer knew that we were putting in lights into certain stalls. And in order for it to be random, we didn't know which horses were going in which stalls. But some of his preferred horses went into the stalls under lights. The significance values that we compute take that into consideration, okay? So there is a, there's not a significant difference in the weights at the start, but there is a clear difference that you can see. But what happened that made it significant is the gap broke between them that actually made them have a larger weight gain in one group versus the other. But yes, he put some of his better horses in the stables under the lights. Um, and that is something that when we do statistics, we use what's called repeated measures analysis of variance, which looks at individual animals changing over time. And that did show that there was a significant increase in our group versus the control group. But yes, they did start out unevenly a little bit at the start. Uh, have you done any... I'm Where ready. am I looking? Okay. <laughs> Anything on stallions? Yes. Breeding stallions? Yes. Uh, I didn't want to add that in here. I actually took it out last night because I knew I, you'd get me up here and I'd be talking for ages. Um, one thing I did want to mention about stallions, yes, they can breed all year round, but we know light significantly affects their sperm concentration, their libido, their reaction time to the mare, the seminal volume, everything, okay? And I am a very strong believer if you have particularly a young sire, because seminal volume and concentration is all a function of testicular size, and the testes get bigger as the animal gets older. Young stallion that's going to be having its peak book number at around March really does not peak in its libido and fertility until mid-June, early July. So those stallions should be under lights as well. Um, from the 1st of December or gradually increasing. And somebody once said, oh, if you bring them in too soon, then they, they peak and they peter out. That's not true, okay? They just, um, they will be at their peak libido and sperm volume at the same time as their peak book number, which is what we want. The limiting factor in how many um, mares a stallion can cover is their libido, is their response to the mare. Stallions in the wild will cover up to 15, 20 times a day, okay? And they'll still get all their mares in full. They will cover and cover and cover. Four times a day is perfectly okay as long as you keep their mind right and their body physically healthy. Um, and obviously that's hard. There was another point I just wanted to make about teasers and how important they are. There is a stallion effect that helps bring mare in, mares into season. If your mares are within sound or sight of a stallion, it's great. And even there's a new study out that shows that you can get recordings of stallion vocalizations and play them in your, your mare barn, and it actually induces estrus behavior and winking and all of it. You can tell whether they're in season by just using the sound. And I, I've seen a patent out there of somebody trying to patent the olfactory sounds of stallions for use. So that might be somebody who'll be speaking here next year. But um, back to stallions, we have, um, because most stallions are kept indoors for safety, 
most good stallion men will put their stallions under lights mid early December, mid December. You can ramp them up slowly or you can do the same as you do with mares um, or at least start in January. Again, use good lighting. So a lot of the, the lights that we'll be developing would be great in stallion barns. Where we've sold light masks to stallion men is where they have stallions that have stereotypic behaviours that per prevent them staying in a box. They have small paddocks. They just need to be out and moving and they use our light masks for that. We have a couple of stallions too that have bad back problems that can't get out very much and the blue light actually improves mood just like it does with us on a sunny day. Using blue light makes them feel better. They'll also coat out sooner, so they'll be nice and shiny and, and look well, because um, it influences them from the inside out, the light that goes in. Was there a difference whether you had the light at the beginning of the day or in the evening? Is, was there a difference in your mirrors? We didn't test that, but there isn't a difference. You can do it three ways. You can put the lights on earlier and leave them a little bit later. You can also give a, a two-hour pulse of light between 3 and 5 a.m. So the science, what's actually happening is the body has this 24-hour system. And when the, light, when, the, when the day ends, when the light stops and melatonin rises, what the body looks for is 10 hours later, is melatonin there or not? So 10 hours post-dusk, dawn comes up. When we extend day length, we means that the lights go off at 11 o'clock, 10 hours later the, the sun has come on, so that is the signal to the body. One other way to do it is to let dusk happen naturally at 4 o'clock but have a timer in your barn so the light goes on between 3 and 5 a.m. for two hour pulse. The problem with that is you don't know if you're, unless you're awake, whether the lights are on, and usually you should have to shift it according to sunset. That's why they use two hours and not one hours. It's used in a few recipient mare barns in Europe for, for embryo transfer. Um, but no, as long as there's 15 to 16 hours day length in every 24 hour cycle consecutively, that's all you need, okay? When we did the, the mask first, the whole idea would be we'd use a rechargeable battery, but the problem with that is the only batteries we could find that worked well needed to be recharged every two weeks, okay? So what breeder is going to bring their mares in, take all the masks off, recharge the battery, put them all on every two weeks throughout the season? It wasn't going to be viable. Next thing we looked at, can we get a longer life battery and change it? And we used to have it so that you could open and change the battery and there was a connection. There were wires and batteries all over fields. They managed, whatever way we put it together, the horses managed to disrupt where it was connected. Then we, we tried again, water got into the, it has to be so waterproof and if you have something that you have to open and close, we found that the, on about 50% of cases, the batteries got fried, so that didn't work. So what we did and what we have done is a battery that lasts for five and a half months, which is longer than it needs to last. That's why people use it for a season. Then they use it to shed out a, a show horse. It takes six weeks to shed out a winter coat. I uh, didn't mention that either, but that's just another part of it. Or they put it back on the mare the following year, two months before she's due to foal. Okay, you should have a month and a half to two months. Instead of having your mares coming in early, use the end of your light mask to get the mares putting a long day length again and bring them into the barn two weeks before they fold, which is probably what you'll do anyway, and leave the lights on over them till 11 o'clock. That gets your two seasons out of it. But we've redesigned it, and it was supposed to be ready for this breeding season, but when we trialled it, they managed to destroy them again. Um, because when you now, what we've done is we've moved the battery to the cup. So this cup, you keep the headpiece and you can snap this on and off every year with a new light, which makes a lot of sense and it's only half the price. Or, mind you, all the expensive bits are in this, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but they managed to get that off. So we have, we're going to have a screw system that you actually, I didn't want something where you needed another tool to do it, but 
it's the way it's going to go for now. So in about six months, hopefully for the Southern Hemisphere season, we'll have a cup that comes off. So the first year you get the whole unit and then the following year you're just buying the four month battery life cup that does that season for that mare. But it should be a lot more affordable. Having said that though, $400 is not that expensive compared to two and a half thousand. But I'm not allowed to say that because I'm a scientist. <laughs> Thank you for your interest. Thank you.